I'm always amazed um, as we approach scripture exegetically and we teach really verse by verse. There are times we do topical sermons here uh, and, and very apropos to what we're going through, but most often uh, we like to just pick a, a book of the Bible and just work through it. Um, for those of you who've been here since uh, 2012, when I came, January 1st, 2012, we started Luke and we still got a couple chapters to finish, which we'll probably honestly finish through 1 Peter uh, with the way we're approaching the scripture. But I always love when I look at, at a week what it might hold. And, and it's probably been, there, there, there isn't a lot of times where I look out on you and I say, I'm not sure what this week holds. I don't know that I've done that uh, maybe five times since I've been here, just concerned about what a week holds. And I think three of those five times have happened in the last year. And this is another one of those weeks. You look at, at what we're watching in the news, what might happen. Um, we're nervous about a lot of things. And then I, I open my, my Bible to the next passage we're supposed to be in. And it just fits beautifully with what we're looking at in, in life. And I think that's the design of exegetical preaching. It's the beauty of the Holy Spirit taking the scriptures and activating them for us. And so this morning, as we start, we're going to look at... 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9, but before we do, I just want to look at a couple stories of Peter's life as we're really cross-referencing Peter's life as the, um, as the poster child of 1 Peter, as the examples of 1 Peter. Uh, Peter writes out of his own life experiences as he writes this epistle. Um, you know, Peter struggled. One of the things that Peter struggled with was to focus on the things of man and not the things of God. Peter, I think when he was called by Jesus, I really do think that he, in, in part of his heart, part of what was going on in his mind is he was an opportunist. He thought, man, this is, this is the guy. This is the guy we've been waiting for. This is the Messiah. And if I jump in now and get to be his right-hand man, there's no telling what we're going to see accomplish in this world. That's my phone. Somebody just went into my house. So if you can mute that, that'd be great. And check the video to see who's robbing me. <laughs> um, it's probably Morgan. She always robs me, so it's no big deal. Um, so Peter, he struggled. He struggled to get out of this terra firma and into the spiritual nuances of what Jesus wanted to do. Matthew chapter 16, we pick up a story here. And Peter gets a, a brutal moment with Jesus where Jesus just looks at him directly and says something to him that I think probably cut to the quick. It probably smarted a little bit. It probably hurt. It says in verse 21 of, of Matthew 16, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. All right, now this is not jiving with what Peter thought Jesus was gonna do. And so Jesus is looking at his disciples and says, you guys understand, I'm gonna be put on trial, I'm gonna die a criminal's death. It has to happen. And Peter's looking at him, he's scratching his head and he's thinking, no, that's not what's supposed to happen here. You're supposed to sit on the throne of Jerusalem. It says in verse 22, and Peter took him aside and he began to rebuke him saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. No, no, Jesus, this is not going to happen. This isn't what's supposed to happen. This isn't why I followed you for three years. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. Have you ever wanted to say that to somebody? I think I've actually said it to people before. Get behind me, Satan. In other words, you know, Peter, you're on Satan's agenda here. Satan would love for me. In fact, Satan tempted me to take hold of the kingdom. Satan took me to the cliff edge and offered me all the kingdoms of the world. That's Satan's plan for, to, for me to be about a physical kingdom. That's Satan's plan for me to be about the stuff of earth. That's not my plan. So if you're going to fall in league with Satan, get behind me and go with Satan. This is where I'm headed. He said, you are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Peter struggled not to get wrapped up in the things of man. Peter struggled to keep his mind off of the stuff of earth and the stuff of man and keep it on Jesus and what Jesus wanted to do. And why this is so important is because just a few months later, maybe a few weeks later, because Peter was dwelling on the stuff of man, when it came to trusting heaven's plan, when it came to trusting that Jesus was who he said he was and that what he wanted was greater than the things of man, he struggled to have hope and he struggled to have courage and he caved in fear. And so we look at another passage, Luke chapter 22, verse 54, Peter's still wrestling, he's still struggling with being involved in the things of man and it says, they seized him, it's talking about Jesus, and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. All right, everything that Jesus just said, to Peter was going to happen is now happening. 
And now Peter has a choice. I can trust that Jesus is good, I can trust that Jesus' plan is perfect, or I can trust my senses and get hopeless because it's not panning out the way I want it to pan out. It says Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. And then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, this man was also with him. She recognized it was Peter, one of the apostles. But he denied it, saying, woman, I do not know him. I don't know who you're talking about. I don't know, I don't know this guy. Denying Jesus. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, you are also one of them. Another person noticed him. And Peter said, man, I know him not. I am not who you think I am. Verse 59, and after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. Remember, the night that Jesus was betrayed in the garden, the night that they had celebrated the Lord's Supper, and Peter was being so hard on everybody who would, would run from Jesus and who would not have courage to fight for Jesus, Peter is, is looked at by Jesus, and Jesus says to Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster even crows in the morning. And here we have it. It says, and immediately while he was speaking, the rooster crowed. And look at verse 61, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Can you imagine? Nothing needs to be said. Jesus looks out, sees Peter. Wow. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord. How he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And this is where we love Peter. This is where we're endeared to Peter because he's, he's visceral, he's emotional, he's honest. It says he went out and he wept bitterly. So we read farther in 1 Peter. Peter's writing this letter from a tender heart, understanding what it's like to suffer, understanding what it's like to fear, understanding what it's like to not know what's going on on this earth and, and trying to rectify it with God's plan. And he's writing with this tenderness, remembering his own struggles of fear, remembering his own struggles with insecurity and hopelessness. And so we pick up this epistle. With a tender hand, as Peter writes, he says this in verse three, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. He gets it now. He understands now. He didn't understand before Jesus died. He's stuck in the stuff of man. He's stuck on this, this earth, this dirt, this soil. And now he can talk about a living hope because he has watched Jesus come out of that tomb victorious. He gets it now. It's all in his head. It's all in his mind. He says this in verse four, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith may become more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire. And it may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The Greek word there for revolution, revelation is apocalypse. It's the apocalypse. When Jesus comes back, our salvation is going to be shining and it's going to bring glory. Verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is one long run-on sentence. We, we see it chopped up by periods and commas and dashes, but it's one long sentence. It's one long continuous thought that Peter writes here. He wants to capture all of the heart, all of the nuance of living hope in times of trial. And what's interesting is he starts off by saying, blessed be God. Now in the Greek, the word be is not there. The English translators have added it because it makes more sense in, in the English language. But really what he's saying there is bless God. Well, how do I bless God? I know how God blesses me, but how do I bless God? What can I bring to God that could actually be a blessing to him? I can't give him cake or, you know, or sing. I mean, it's, none of it matters. How do I bless God? You bless God by simply attributing him the glory that he's due. It's worship. 
And he says, you, you bless God by recognizing the glory of God, the kindness of God, the mercy of God, the hope of God. We should worship God. We should bring God blessing. Why? We worship God in response to the living hope that comes from our permanent inheritance. We have a living hope that results in a permanent inheritance that really stems from an imper- a, a permanent inheritance. Now what is meant by a living hope in verse three? He says, blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There was a, a wise man who talked to Jesus about entering heaven, and he says, how do I do? And he says, you have to be born again, and that was a, such an interesting concept. How, how can, he said, how can a man re-enter the womb and be born again? He's talking about spiritually. He's talking about having a brand new inside. Forget the outside. The outside's not important. It's what's inside that matters. And because Jesus is alive, because Jesus came out of that tomb to give us hope, our hope is alive. If Jesus was dead, we'd have a dead hope. But because Jesus is alive, we have a living hope. Our hope in Jesus is living because Jesus is alive. I think we have a kid's question here. The kids are in the answer today as we continue our study on Peter. We're talking about living hope. What does a living hope mean? And I wrote it in there in your, in your kid's sheet. Jesus is our hope and Jesus is alive, so our hope is alive. If Jesus is our hope and he brings us hope and Jesus is alive, then our hope that comes from Jesus is alive also. It is something that is living within us. It continues with us. My soul isn't merely alive for what awaits me after death. I think we get so focused on the afterlife. There's a living hope for now. This is about right now. My soul is alive for today that I might live in victory today. And that's why Paul references being raised in newness of life when he speaks of baptism. Well, what's our inheritance? Well, the simple answer is our inheritance is salvation. It's salvation. He says in verse four, we're raised to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be healed in the last time. So salvation is our inheritance. Kids, if you're taking notes, I think there's a kid sheet answer here. Um, what is our inheritance? It's salvation. It's God saving me from myself. That's what salvation means. It means God has saved me from all of my sin, all of my sin that would destroy my life. He wants to save me from that. Peter says there's a few things we need to understand about our salvation. First of all, it is imperishable. That means we cannot lose it. We call this in theological terms the perseverance of the saints. If you have received Christ, if you've truly given him your life, your salvation will persevere. You will not lose it. And I'm thankful for that because I have to tell you, every single day, I ruin it. Every single day, I struggle with sin. I need God to give me an imperishable salvation that works beyond my sinfulness and my struggles. Secondly, he says it is unfading and undefiled. And that means it remains an absolutely miraculous privilege regardless of how I view it. Sometimes we lose the joy of our salvation and yet it is still a miracle. Sometimes I forget how blessed I am, how much mercy and grace has been bestowed upon me and yet my salvation remains a miraculous thing that God has done and is continuing to do. And thirdly, he said, it is being guarded through faith. My faith guards my salvation. Now that can be discouraging if we wrestle with faith, if we wrestle with believing in God and we struggle with doubts, and yet the Bible also tells us that if my faith is guarding my salvation, Jesus is completing my faith because he's the author and completer of my faith. So therefore, Jesus has my faith, Jesus is strengthening my faith, and my faith is guarding my salvation. That means Jesus is guarding my salvation. It says in Hebrews 12 that he is the author and completer of my faith. Thankful for that because there are times when I struggle with my faith. I need the strong faith, the strong uh, power of the Holy Spirit to hold me in. Now, the title of my message this morning is this, A Living Hope, 
our inheritance during inherent trials. Our inheritance during inherent trials. Why are trials inherent? What does that even mean? Well, inherent means necessary and consistent. It's going to happen. And the Bible communicates again and again that trials are necessary and consistently going to happen. He says this in verse 6 and 7. He says, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Trials, if you can say it this way, trials are the polish that reveal the value of faith. Why are trials inherent? Why are they necessary? Why do they consistently happen to us? Why is this year happening and all that we're facing? Because trials are the polish that reveal the value of our faith. I want to illustrate this way. He references the smelting of gold and burning away all the impurities and bringing it out as pure. I brought with me today a little copper box. Uh, It's copper and tin. And uh, inside this I have um, a couple things. Uh, first of all, this is a, a copper nugget, and I dug this myself out of the earth. I, when we go up to uh, Lake Michigan, I like to hunt for copper, and so I take a metal detector, and I know where to look. I know where the old mines were. And uh, so this is about a, a, a one and a half or maybe two ounce nugget that I found here. And this is what it looks like when it comes out of the earth. It doesn't look like much, does it? Just like a rock. If you were to hold it in your hand, you'd feel how heavy it is. You'd see the copper metal in there uh, built around the quartz crystal. Now, when this is put under an acid bath, all right, I've got one that's been cleaned up, and this is what it looks like. See the copper there? All right, there's a big difference, right? This is what it looked like coming out of the earth. This is what it looks like after a nice, fun acid bath. And I've done some acid baths. I found a copper nugget about this big a few years ago, and in this acid, this muriatic acid that you use to clean these things up will burn the skin off your bones. It is, it is not, in fact, you've got to be in an open space. If you're in an enclosed room, it'll burn your lungs out. This is powerful stuff. But when you put it under this, this acid bath, This is what it comes out to. And now, the person who wants to use this to make something takes it and hammers it out with a big stamp press, and they hammer it into sheets, and then they start to bend it and fold it, and they mix some tin with it to make it a little more pliable, and then you can make something like this. Now, the process from this to this, that isn't a fun process. It goes through an acid bath, it gets stamped and beaten and pressed, shaped. I can't imagine that that feels good for a nice chunk of copper. And that is exactly what Jesus is talking about here through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and through Peter's letter. He wants us to understand that trials bring us through this process so that our faith can be practical and usable and beautiful. That's the benefit of trial. It is inherent because it is necessary. And until we go through that process, this is about what we look like. It's really not much to see. I don't think we understand in this country, I think we're beginning to scratch the surface of the value of suffering as believers. I I have prayed for years, you've heard me pray for years if you've been here. I've prayed that God would bring the church into suffering and persecution. Why? Because I believe it is necessary to cleanse the American church and to make it truly fit and beautiful for worship. And maybe we're just scratching the surface. I don't know. I just know that Peter says it's necessary. Trials remove everything that is not of faith. That my faith might become the only thing I value. Trial allows all the stuff that is unnecessary, all the stuff that makes me look like this, to to go away, to, to burn away, to melt away, to be cleaned away, so that I can be ready for God to do an important and special work. That's what trial does. Wow, I go through a trial and I realize this was not my hope. This was not my source of strength. I didn't even need this. God took it away and yet we're still okay. We're still living. We're still breathing and God is still doing a work and I can still find joy. That must have been dirt. That wasn't precious. 
Peter wants us to remember that trial is not given to us by God flippantly without a loving cause. There's always a purpose he's trying to accomplish. And this is why he uses the words here in this verse, necessary. He says, if necessary. That's a kind word. If necessary. Trials are only brought when they are necessary. God doesn't flippantly give us trials because it's fun to torture us. He isn't up there maniacally laughing. <laughs> Let's see if he survives this one, right? No, if necessary. And then he says various trials, all right? So he brings trials when they're necessary, and then he brings them according to the various things he needs to accomplish. So the trial he brings to me is specific to what he accomplishes to me, and the trial he brings to you is specific to what he needs to accomplish to you, and sometimes he needs to accomplish the same exact things, and we go through the same exact trials. But there's this tenderness to it. There's this care about it. It's if necessary, and it's according to the various needs. In other words, God never wastes pain. God never wastes pain. There's always a point and a purpose to it. It should bring us joy. New American Standard Bible uses the words rejoice exceedingly. Rejoice exceedingly. In other words, inexpressible joy as as the ESV puts it. Words that don't translate it well. Trying to say something I don't have words for. Trying to put happiness into, into words that don't fit. I love when kids get excited, especially when it's about candy, and they start to just, you see them, they're just moving, and they're excited, and you know, and like Christmas, and, and just, there's, there's things happening and being communicated that don't come out through words, because there's exceeding joy. There's so much happiness. Now here's what's interesting here. This word for rejoice There are two words for joy or happiness or rejoicing used predominantly in scripture in the Greek. One is agaliao, and that's this word, all right, rejoice exceedingly, but the one more commonly used is the word kairo, okay, and we get the word charisma or charismatic from it. When we we are kairo, we are happy, it's, it's visible, but agaliao comes from something different. It comes from something inside of us. It's not always something that can be seen on the outside. It's something that works its way to the outside. Let me explain it this way, all right? The difference between happiness and joy here, Cairo and agaliao. Happiness, or Cairo, works its way into our hearts. So if you want to see a person become happy on the outside, you give me a nice big donut from Dunkin' Donuts or somewhere else, and you watch the happiness invade my space, and I become happier. I got hangry the other day. We were driving around. I was driving just, I was angry driving. I was hangry driving. And my wife's like, you need to eat. So we whip into a a, a drive-thru, and I got, and she could just, okay, you're better now. Yeah, Cairo, the happiness entered me. I have food, all right? It works its way in. But agaliao works its way out. It's the joy of the Lord and it works its way out of our hearts and it affects the outside from the inside. And trial, it mines our spiritual joy as it removes the distractions of the unnecessary dirt. And so trial mines the inner joy that only can come from the Holy Spirit. It works its way out. Here's what's interesting about this. Jesus used both words when he talked about trial. He used Cairo and Agliao. In Matthew chapter 5, in verse 11 through 12, he says this, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. All right, you're blessed. He says this, Rejoice, Cairo, and be glad, Agaliao, for your reward is great in heaven. All right? So that means I rejoice in the fact that I get to to face this persecution. Well, that's no fun, but I can rejoice in it because I realize God is doing a work and then the joy from the inside comes out as well because I know that my reward is great in heaven for so he says, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Peter lived this out personally along with the other disciples It says in Acts chapter five, verse 40 and 41, when they had called in the apostles, they were were on trial and they're brought in, all right, to trial. It says they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then let them go. And then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And it uses the word Cairo. 
They rejoiced. They actually found joy in the exterior beating they received without just cause. Because they realized it was for Jesus. They recognized the external value. And it activated the inner joy. So how do I hold on to the joy of my salvation? That inner joy, how do I hold on to that? How do I make that preeminent? Because I'm not always going to feel Cairo. I'm not always going to be happy about what God is doing externally in this world, in my life, in my family, in my health, in my finances. I'm not always going to be happy about that, but I can find joy because there's another source of joy that's inside of me. How do I hold on to that joy? How do I hold on to the joy of my salvation? Well, he says this in verses 8 and 9, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible, same word there, and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Agaliao. A joy that is inexpressible, a joy from another source, a joy from inside, from the Holy Spirit, from the power of God. How do I do that? Well, I have to remember three things about my salvation if I'm going to hold on to the joy of my salvation. First of all, I have to remember salvation past. I must remember salvation past. I must take my mind back to what life was like before Jesus saved me. And so for some of you kids, that wasn't long ago. All right, and you can, if you're writing your notes, kids, I must remember salvation past. You, some of you kids, you... You, you were saved like when you were four, five, six, seven. You weren't out like partying and drunk driving and selling drugs and all this other stuff before you were saved. I mean, I hope you weren't. You'd be really rotten if you were. So you look backwards and, and you're just like, well, I, I was the same kid. Yeah, but if you could tell yourself what life would be like if you didn't have Jesus, remind yourself even though maybe you were young when you were saved, and some of you can remember your testimony, I mean, it is easy to see who I was before Jesus and who I am after Jesus, but sometimes we have to fill in the blanks. What would have happened if Jesus hadn't saved me at an early age? I was saved at four years old. That's my testimony. Look at all of the life, 39 years plus after that, that God has preserved me for his glory. What a, what a miraculous thing that God has done. And we have to rehearse our salvation. We have to remember what a miracle it is. Uh, David said it this way. He wrote this psalm, Psalm 51. And the whole psalm is about all of the things he he felt after he had messed up his life. He had committed adultery. He had committed murder. He had perjured himself. He had done all of these things. And so he's writing this song of penance in Psalm 51. And he says this. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a a willing spirit. He says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Remind me of what you've done in my life. Because I've screwed it all up. I don't remember what you've done. I don't want to think about what I've done. I think the beauty of confession is the opportunity to remember the gospel. But we don't just need to rehearse the gospel after sin and confession. We need to rehearse the gospel before we sin. That we might realize the fleeting and empty nature of sin. If Jesus has given me so much, why would I go to that fleeting thing? Why would I put my hope there? Why would I put my trust there, my joy there, when he has given me so much? Why would I trade this to go back to this? Secondly, I must remember, I must remind myself of salvation present. We talk about salvation as if it's a one-time thing that happened in the past. God is still saving you. He is still doing a work of salvation. No, you can't lose your salvation, but you're still in process. We call it sanctification. He's still doing a work to hold on to you, to to persevere in his work, to to keep you moving forward. In verse 9, Peter uses the present Tense here, he says, you are obtaining the outcome of your faith. All right, I didn't already obtain it. I obtained my faith, and now I'm obtaining the outcome of my faith, which is salvation present. God is doing a work of saving me. Those benefits include God's involvement in strengthening my faith, establishing a godly reputation and testimony for me, and revealing his glory through my life. Kids, if you're taking notes, all right? I must remind myself of salvation present. Kids, do you know that every time you choose to do the right thing, 
that that is God doing a work in you. Every time you choose to be obedient or tell the truth or do the right thing that God is leading you to do, that is God's salvation working itself out in you. And every time you do the wrong thing, your salvation is also working to save you and preserve you. And that's why the Bible says you can confess your sins and receive forgiveness. The final thing that Peter says about our salvation and about holding on to joy, he says we must focus on salvation future. I must focus on salvation future. In verse five, Peter reminds us that our salvation will be fully revealed in the last time. And he uses that word, apocalypso, or apocalypse. Someday all the glories of God's salvific work will be revealed and none of what we have gone through will matter. It will all have been worth it. We used to sing this hymn in church, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small, right? Someday it's all gonna make sense and I can hold on to that and I, and I have to remind myself of that. I must focus on that. Kids, if you're taking notes, I must focus on salvation future. You know, kids, it's okay for you sometimes to look at your parents and remind them of salvation. You have, the Bible says that we're supposed to be like you. The Bible says we're supposed to have faith like children. And I can't tell you how many times my girls, when they were little, my son right now as an eight-year-old, looks at me and says, hey, Dad, you talk about this all the time. We can trust Jesus. Jesus loves us. He's got a plan. He has saved us. Heaven's gonna be awesome someday. And I need him to preach to me the faith that I'm supposed to have because he's got the faith I'm supposed to have. And so kids, you know, this is really a, a powerful thing for you. Speak to us, preach to us adults, remind us of the promises of God that we're too smart to trust, right? Because you have the faith we need. As I wrap up this morning, here's my applicational thought for you. What should separate the believer in this culture is joy. If we can't find joy, and I'm not talking about Cairo, we don't have to be happy, all right? If you're a Duck Dynasty fan, you don't have to be happy, happy, happy all the time, all right? Sometimes we're not happy. Sometimes we don't like what we're going through, but we are to be people of joy. We are to have joy. The Bible commands it, and that joy comes from an inner strength. It comes from another source. That's why we can possess it. And so what should separate the believer in this culture is joy. Joy can only come with a right perspective on the inherent blessing of the trial of our faith and the inheritance that waits us in the future. Understanding our salvation. This gives us a living hope that results in joy. So here's my charge for you this week and every week. Listen to the inner joy. All right, I'm not gonna go Disney on you. I'm not gonna tell you to listen to your heart. The Bible says your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, all right? So listen to the joy. Listen to the inner joy of your salvation. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Listen to what Jesus is reminding you of in his care for you, in his grace, in his mercy, in his forgiveness of your struggles, in his promise to provide you his righteousness. Listen to that joy and let that joy inform how you see the world. And then the Cairo, the happiness, just might follow is we are different than the rest of the world that is fleeting, that is discouraged, yeah? Let's stand and let's apply some of these heart concepts to our mind through the singing and prayer as we wrap up this morning. So Sean, lead us in a song that will kind of bring this to our hearts and minds and then we'll, we'll close and be dismissed.